All right. Hello, folks. Uh, I think people are slowly going to start trickling in here. We will give it uh, another two minutes uh, or so um, before we get started. So just hang tight and uh, we'll begin shortly. Okay, so welcome everybody. We will get started uh, just past the hour here. Um, thank you for joining today. We have a great webinar, the overview and new evidence related to diabetic peripheral neuropathy with Virginia Blanchett, very excited. Um, today's presentation will be about 45 minutes or so with uh, the last 15 minutes set aside for a Q&A. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A widget, a little button. Um, please feel free throughout the entire presentation to ask questions. Um, and uh, we will make sure we get to as many as possible by the end of the presentation. Um, there's also a chat option, but we would, um, we'd love for you to use the Q&A button down at the bottom. Uh, today's presentation will be recorded and available on demand for uh, you to reference later um, or for for um, your colleagues uh, or any of your peers who, who might have missed it. Um, so again, a great presentation today. I would like to introduce um, Virginia is the first uh, podiatrist PhD in Quebec and has been an associate professor in the uh, podiatric medicine program at the University de Quebec at Trois-Rivières since 2014. Her research specialty is prevention and management of diabetic foot ulcers and their complications with a limb preservation approach within patient-oriented research. She's mentored by David G. Armstrong and a Diabetes Action Canada trainee in knowledge translation with Dr. France Laguerre. She has joined the Diabetic Foot Canada Task Force in 2019 and joined the Wounds Canada Board of Directors in 2021. She's determined as an agent of change to act against amputation with and for all Canadians. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Virginia. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you to Diabetes Canada to invite me to speak with you to, to today. Uh, first, as you can heard, I'm a French speaker, so please be indulgent with my English speaking and also may have some grammatical and spelling mistake in my PowerPoint, so I apologize. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge that I'm living and working on the traditional lands of the Abenaki and Atikamek people, and I would like to pay my respect both past and present communities. So, speaker disclosure, uh, I have no uh, relationship with commercial interests related to this presentation, and no, there I have no, uh, I did not receive uh, financial support for this presentation or income in-kind support, so I don't have any conflict of interest. Um, the information that will be presented today is sources from current clinically acceptable evidence, and I will not discuss brands uh, in the presentation. I want to say that I'm a board of, direct, of the direct, a board of director of Wounds Canada, and uh, my research program in development is fi financed by Di Diabetes Action Canada, Diabetes Quebec, American Limb Preservation Society, Wounds Canada, Raison Québec, Ordre des Podias du Québec, Vitam Research Centers, and also University du Québec at Trois-Rivières. So the objective of this session is to define diabetic, diabetic peripheral neuropathy to support daily clinical practice. So it may be revision for many people in the webinar. And then we will explore why the prevent prevention and the management of diabetes peripheral neuropathy is so important. And uh, we will identify interprofessional strategies to manage DPN, painful or not. And Diabetes Canada uh, asked me to focus on painful uh, DPN. 
Add, add to make some choices for the presentation today. This is a broad topic to cover in 45 minutes presentation and 50 minutes question. Uh, so I will not talk about everything. And I, I know the I know this. Uh, I will try to focus on knowledge and action that can make a difference in clinical practice from my point of view related to the learning objective. So the first objective to define DPN to support daily clinical practices. Uh, we have to know as clinician, because I'm also a clinician, I'm a podiatrist, that there is different uh, type of neuropathies. And the, the neuropathies that we will discuss today, it is the diabetic sensor, sensory mother polyneuropathy, which is, which as as a definition that this is a symmetrical length dependent sensory motor polyneuropathy that result from metabolic and microvascular alterations secondary to chronic hyperglycemia and other, other cardiovascular risk factor. This is the most prevalent of neuropathic syndrome in diabetes. And I want to draw your attention to the different uh, fiber that can be um, involved in this type of neuropathy. So there is a predominantly large fiber, the a predominantly small fiber, and there is also a per small fiber neuropathy. If you only test only one fiber, as an example with the monofilament, you can pass by to a person at risk with DPN or with DPN. So it's why it's important to know what, what it what this um, disease, what this condition is uh, in, in, in the summary of the condition to know how to test it and what we you need as a clini clinician to, to check when you want to, to evaluate the risk of a patient. Uh, also, uh, there is different type of, uh, of uh, neuropathy, but today we will uh, focus on acute painful distal sensory polyneuropathies. And it, it's it's likely to be reduced by glucose control. So uh, it is the only one that can be a little bit reversible. Um, and we have to keep in mind that there is different presentation, so we can have different approaches. And I cannot discuss in the webinar all the different approaches, approaches because there is no treatment fits all. Uh, but today it will be my focus. At the same time, there is, uh, a lot of differ differential di diagnosis to DPN. And when we we trying to, to, to search, to look, to, to screen a patient, uh, to assess a patient for DPN, we have to keep in mind in the cl clinical rationale, uh, in the based on the detail of patient history and examination, uh, because diabetes is not only the the only things that can cause DPN. And um, sometimes when, uh, as a clinician, we, we, found, uh, we found that there is a lack of protective sensation, we think it's, that it may be because of the diabetes, but it's not always because of the diabetes. So we have to, to stay open-minded as clinician uh, to look to the large picture to see if there is not another condition that can cause the, the neuropathy that it may not be only the diabetes and the and it's possible that two or three or more conditions coexist at the same times and we will have to manage the dpn from the diabetes and the diabetes and the, the dpn from other other uh, etiology uh, conditions so we have to keep in mind that DPN is more than only uh, diabetes, but um, we have to, 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 to look closely, to look carefully when we assess a patient. We, not, we need also to clarify the terminology. Uh, the DPN is a, is a di distal symmetrical polyneuropathy, and it's called diabetes peripheral neuropathy. Uh, but this is the common, the commonest symptom in diabetes. Um, 
it's what it's meant in clinical practice when we talk we're talking about diabetic neuropathy. It, this is the most prevalent neuropathic syndrome, um, and we don't we don't have to lose our time to explain to the patient what are all the differences between autonom autonomic, um, mother and sensitive, because it's, it's become to be, it, it, it's become too complicated for the patient to understand. So in, in clinical setting, we can discuss about differ differences, but for the patient, uh, it, it may be more concrete uh, to explain about the loss of sensitivity um, and to provide education about self-management and raise awareness about the common, the common terminology, so diabetic neuropathy. There is different risk factor for DPN, so an increasing ages, uh, age, an increasing duration of diabetes, a poor glycemic control, so elevated blood glucose levels, retinopathy, albumin, albumin, albuminuria, Vascular risk factor, such as elevated tr triglycerides, obesity, smoking, hypertension. Um, the, the past few years, I've seen, uh, I've seen a concerning increase in the number of young people with di diabetes. So if people have diabetes younger, they may develop DPN at a younger age. And um, it, it, the literature demonstrates that there is a premature onset of complication. Uh, about 22% of younger people will de can develop neuropathy at the age of 32 years old. So in clinical setting, what this what this can mean that we we have to screen not only patient, uh, older patient, but we need to screen patient with um, diabetes, uh, early onset of diabetes, because they can develop this kind of complication at their early stage. The presentation is, is sim it's simple, but not simple at the same time. So it's, it's, it's always begin with the, the toe bilaterally and become more proximal and with uh, when the disease the, the disease progress, it can touch also, uh, it can involve also the upper limbs, uh, the end particularly. Uh, it is a stocking distribution, and they can and it will have advanced manifestation, motor and manifestation following the sensory loss. So if there is uh, mother manifestation before the sensory loss, it's maybe not because it's not DPN. It's maybe something else or something congenital, something um, gene genetically, but not about, it is not about DPN. Uh, in the mother part of the, the DPN, it is um, muscle weaknesses, wasting small muscles, foot function. Uh, there is also the extensor alexis longus uh, is not able to do his function anymore. So you, we can see uh, amaring hallux. Um, uh, the high arch of the foot can be um, become more, um, more, um, I forgot the word, sorry. But the arching of the foot is, um, is uh, is lower uh, there is they can have abnormal knee reflexes claw hammer toes uh, foot deform deformity and uh, it is insidious so at the beginning it, it it's asymptomatic and at some point it can have a combination of symptoms like numbness or dead feeling paresthesia and neuropathic pain and in several sensory loss uh, a lot of patients will have painful neuropathic symptoms, such as burning, electric shock type, sharp cold and aching pain, hyperalgesia, allodynia, and the intensity of neuropathic pain is typically worse at night, frequently causing insomnia. So there is a lot of pathophysiological mechanism of DPN and painful, painful DPN. And if I'm, I'm sticking to the clinical aspect of DPN, I will not explain it in detail today because it's not relevant. But if you're interested to see all the, 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 the fundamental mechanism, I'm suggesting this review because you will have a, a, a summary of how 
how the DPN is developing and how the, the painful uh, DPN is developing in our body. And it, it will be really interesting to explain to the, to the patient if a, pers a person wants to know more or to discuss with colleagues or just for general knowledge. So I'm suggesting this publication. So this is one problem. One problem of DPN is that the diagnostic is really complicated. Um, there is a group from Toronto, uh, the Toronto Diabetic Neuropathy Expert Group, uh, define what are the minimal diagnostic criteria. So first of all, if you are able to, 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 when you assess your patient to have to have presence of symptoms and signs of DPN, you can, as a clinician, say that there is a possible uh, DPN on this patient. Uh, but uh, in clinical practice, we need, we need more than possibility possibilities. We need a uh, probable. So to have a probable diagnostic, uh, we have to, to have the symptom and sign of DPN, but it need to include two or more neuropathic symptoms that I describe it in the presentation of the condition and a reduced distal sensation of and or, or abnormal ankle reflexes. So both need to be done to, to define that this patient have a probable DPN to confirm the diagnosis. So in clinical practice, we will highly suspect a DPN, but not all patients will go in more invasive uh, investigation. But in some cases, we should prescribe more investigation to a patient, and particularly when there is abnormal symptoms or uh, abnormal presentation. So uh, you, we have to, to, to conduct analysis to see if there is abnormal nerve conduction and abnormal physio, uh, physio, uh, physiology of the nerve uh, with a validated measure for small fiber neuropathy like uh, skin biopsy or thermal threshold testing. And we have to have at the same time the symptoms and sign of DPN. There is also subclinical uh, presentation of the disease of the condition that the patient don't have any symptoms and signs, but in the testing for maybe another condition of something, uh, it, it's validated that there is a presence of DPN. And uh, I, I talk about the there is neurophysiology testing, nerve speed conduction, neurotensiometer to test the large fiber. So this is a busy slide, I'm so sorry. Uh, there is um, there is different uh, questionnaires that we can be used in clinical setting to evaluate the symptoms and sign of DPN. Uh, score score of of clinical assessment provide a standardized, quantitative, objective, and reproducible measure. So if you have time in clinic, please use this kind of questionnaire. Uh, it, it used to, to screen, to diagnose it, and to grade the severity of DPN, and it can provide a probable diagnosis, but it is time consuming. The most widely used instrument is the Michigan Neuropathy Screening Instrument Questionnaire. And this is a self-administrated questionnaire. And there is also the, the Michigan Neuropathy Screening Instrument that combine the questionnaire and the structural clinical evaluation. And uh, there is, after that, some bedside assessment and foot screening that can be done. And we need to do it to uh, fulfill the criteria to diagnose the, the pathology. Uh, so there is the monofilament, the Ipswich test. Um, there is also the, the thermal and the vibration threshold. Um, there is different testing and we will talk a bit later about it and you may be already know, but it's so important to, to, to do it. And then there is the gold standard. The gold standard, it is, it is the, 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 
nerve conduction uh, evaluation uh, screen, uh, but there is also, also the, skin, the skin biopsy that can be uh, relevant to perform. And the new, the, the novelty is the corneal nerves as a biomarker. So to look with corneal confocal microscopy, the quality of the corneal uh, the little corneal nerve, it can help to, eva to evaluate the small fiber, and it is a way to measure if the patient has neuropathy, because uh, all the testing, it is more about large fiber, but not about uh, small fi fiber, so it can support to the diagnostic. And Carmichael and Al uh, publish a recent review about all the diagnostic tests for DPN. So if you want to know more, and because I'm sometimes not uncompressible because of my speaking, go uh, read this paper and it will be very informative for, to, to support your clinical practice. But in real context, uh, we, as I already said, we, evaluate, we, we do the evaluation of probable DPN. Uh, because why we're doing that? It's just because there is many people with diabetes and we want to manage the risk of complication, complication and we want to manage the symptoms. So even if we know if the, it is highly suspected for a patient, it will not provide more info, information for the, what we will do next if we have the confirmed diagnostic um, comparing to the prob probable diagnostic. So it's why we are, uh, it, it is why not all the patients going to do more invasive tests and, and it is really expensive to, to do for uh, healthcare system. So it is why we, we're doing this way. So it is really important to, to to talk about again and again, because I'm pretty sure that a lot of people in the in the webinar know that the 10 grams monofilament is the way to measure large fiber uh, to, to measure the loss of protective, protective sensation. So this is the, the figure from the Diabetes Canada guideline how to perform a, a, a monofilament. Um, and you can refresh your mind about how to do it because it is what is it's really matter at the end. It's to do it and to do it well. And um, there is many ways of doing the monofilament. And, and, and this is a problem because if in a setting you're doing a way and in other setting you're doing another way, you may not find the same result and it can be really complicated for the patient to say, oh, um, uh, the, the nurses say I have neuropathy, but another person say I don't have, I don't have the, this condition. So we have to find a way to doing, to doing all the same technique. Because the literature demonstrate that there is many techniques, but they may be equally effective if they are adequately performed. So it's all about how to perform it, how to teach, to, how to perform it, and uh, and it is it is how it is what is the way to do it in your clinical setting. If everybody is talking the same languages in the primary care in the multidisciplinary team, hospital based care team, uh, it will be helpful to to give the the correct information to the patient. It is also about the accuracy and durability of the monofilament. Uh, if we're talking about not a one-use monofilament, but with a monofilament that we can reuse, uh, we, we, we should not use the monofilament if uh, the monofilament lost more than 10% of their initial bending force. Because when you're using the monofilament, you have to bend it a little bit, uh, like in the picture like in the picture to, to put the pressure. So if it lost a little bit of the bending force, we don't, we cannot use the monofilament in the, anymore. It has been demonstrated that some monofilament, uh, including single use, can evaluate up to 70 to 90 patients for 10 site testing. And after 10 
patient, monoflamin need to a uh, recovery time of 24 hours. Um, so it, in Wounds Canada, it is suggested that we should use the monofilament for two, hour, uh, two hours following a total of 100 applications. So 20 sites per patient for a total of five evaluation. And then we should take another monofilament. Uh, and we have also to select a high quality instrument and replacing it regularly at a regularly interval uh, to maintain the testing accuracy. And we should do a proper disinfection of uh, monofilament uh, between patients. And um, the disposable monofilament should be only used for only one patient. And if we use it, if you, we using properly, if we using on a one site, four site, 10 site, eight site, doesn't matter. We will be able to 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 identify what we need to identify with monofilament. So this is the loss of protecting, uh, protecting sensation, and monofilament it is to identify large fiber deficiency neuropathy, and the vibration turning for it is to identify small small fiber neuropathy. So if you remember at the beginning, I I, I told you that there is different. Um, uh, type of uh, DPN. So if we only perform the monofilament, we can say to the patient that you don't have loss of protecting sensation, but the patient can have neuropathy of the small fiber. So it's why we have to do two testing at the same time to identify if the patient is at risk or has a neuropathy. Uh, so the vibration tuning fork, tuning fork uh, it is the use of uh, one, um, 138 hertz turning fork to see if the patient can perceive the vibration. And this is the, 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 the protocol of doing the, vi the, the vibration testing from Diabetes Canada. So you have to test the vibration before, not on the end, because it may have neuropathy on the end. So this is not logic to test the vibration in the end. So test, test it on the forearm of the patient, the forehead of the patient or in the arm of the patient. And you can try it on the allux interphalangeal inter inter join in the first metatarsal join uh, in the international malleolus in the tibial tuberosity and in the patella and when you testing the vibration you just ask the patient yes or no if it, if it can feel the vibration and you can comparing to you if 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 you are able to to perceive the vibration or not and and it will be it it will be helpful to know where the patient lost the the vibration perception and it can give um it can give a, a certain a, a, a certain way um not a certain way but it can provide an information about the quality of the small fiber of the patient in by doing this test. So it's it's always important to, to doing this test, but we always talking about monofilament, but this is both tests are needed. And it is the message I want to share with you to, today. The both tests are needed to, 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 to identify a probable DPN. Why the prevention and management of DPN is so important? Uh, but, there is some fact to remember. So DPN is underestimated because it's difficult to screen, it's difficult to identify. DPN is a lifetime prevalence of 50% for people with diabetes and 1% increase of uh, hemoglobin, uh, glycated hemoglobin result in an estimate 10% higher prevalence of DPN. But DPN can be avoided and delayed and we know that four out of five amputations are evitable. Are evitable. We know that 75 of diabetic foot ulcers are, are evitable, and diabetic foot re, diabetic related foot disease are already a burden. So when there is neuropathic pain in 30 uh, in 13 to 35 percent, and neuropathic pain is more in type two diabetes, uh, it's increasing diabetes and then it reduces quality reduce quality of life. 
So it is why we need, we need to do something about it. The pathway to food complication is it, it, it's complicated. It, it's, it's something that we learn and we, we learn as clinician, but the patient don't need to don't need to know all, all that. Uh, we should not focus to explain all the pathway to complication to the patient instead of focusing of what uh, can reduce the risk of complication. So in this in, in this figures, all the blue the blue boxes are the risk factor and poor healing uh, factor that can lead to uh, foot uh, to, to foot complication. And I want to just highlight that D, uh, DPN is the DPN is 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 the the trigger point. It's the the first thing that will start all the pathway to the foot complication. And this is also the things that will lead to Charcot and neuroarthropathy and uh, the loss of protective sensation. So the sensory neuropathy will lead to repeti repetitive, repetitive trauma, micro trauma, that will lead to charcoal. So two on set for charcoal and one, one on set, one being on set. So the DPN for all the complication to the diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, it's the main precipitate precipitating factors, diabetic foot ulcer, charcoal, amputation, but also for other clinical sequelae of DPN that we don't, we don't talk, uh, talk a lot. So the distressing uh, peripheral neuropathic pain, so painful DPN, uh, sometimes we are so um, focused about limb preservation, about amputation ulcer that we forget, we, we are forgetting to manage the, the 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 painful DPN and the patient will not will will not talk ab about what he, he can feel. There there is strange because he will focus on the because the clinician will focus on the on on the will focus on the the diabetic photo sir, but we have to manage both at the same time. And other things, it's the increased risk of falls. Uh, neuropathy will lead to that, and we have to take care of that as clinician. Also, it's about the recurrence of the di diabetic photosur. Uh, I, I discuss a lot about uh, vibration testing, but it's why I wanted to show you how it is important. We know that 50% of diabetic foot ulcers are recurrent in one year. And we know in that in 10 years, a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer has at least nine chances on 10 to have an, another diabetic foot ulcer in the another place in the foot. So this is a vicious circle. And once you have one, <laughs> you may have other one. But if you only if you check in the patient in the patient only the loss of protective sensation, you can uh, you can lost the opportunity to to do prevention about the recurrence diabetic foot ulcer because it's it's demonstrated that the vibration is is one of the main factor to that can lead to recurrence diabetes ulcer. So diabetes foot ulcer may be linked to small fiber complication. And it's why we need to screen it to know if it is both small and large fiber neuropathy or, or if our patient has only small fiber neuropathy. If our patient have small fiber neuropathy, we should do a lot of action to prevent the recurrent ulcer. Uh, so it is why it's so important. If we look to the old ratio, it's four times more for vibration than for the monofilament testing. As there are currently no therapeutic agent for DPM treatments, this is an irreversible condition. Early detection is essential to modify any risk factor. So we can treat only the symptom. This is what we need to share with the population. We have to spread the news. Uh, if we focus only about amputation, the loss of the limb, um, 
if we don't explain that if you lost the capacity to feel the, the it can lead to problem yes but if you explain that once you lose this capacity you will never be able to feel again it can be easier to understand for the patient it's like that if you we it, it, in parallel if we say to the patient that we, if you lost your vision and it's not possible to have it again or you lost a kidney you will not be able to have it it is the same for painful neuropathy um, not painful but for uh, neuropathy if you lost lost the capacity you will not able to feel it again they may may be more on on this understand that they need to do to do something because it's when we we discuss about oh you can lose a leg you can uh, you can have a ulcer uh, a wound it can be oh i will not have a wound it's it can be uncompressible for for the patient uh, because if the patient look to is or her feet every day say, I don't have wounds, I have nothing, so I'm okay. But we have to explain something invisible to the patient by explaining that he will lose something. It may be helpful to, to, to support what we're trying to do by our education. The diagnostic is often late and therefore irreversible nerve damage are has already taken place. So in 25% of patients uh, who, who uh, seek for the first time for medical attention, it's because they feel neuropathic pain in 35% of the time. And they did not have any screening before that. We have to do our early screening. So <clears throat> all people with diabetes should have an annual foot screening exam. So recent, uh, literature review uh, demonstrate that in Canada, we only check the patient for loss of productive sensation in 51% of all the patients with diabetes. So we need to do more, uh, we need to do better. And it's why we need a diabetes national strategy for foot screening. And the minimum is not achieved. The minimum to look for, uh, for, for uh, the loss of productive sensation is not achieved. So to do the other things, uh, the basic is not done. So do other things, it can be more complicated. Uh, there is why we're doing a foot screening. We're doing foot screening because there is risk classification, low, moderate, high, very high risk mod modification, uh, risk classification. And depending of the clinical indicator and all, for all those classification, the first indicator is the loss of predicting sensation. Uh, it will help us to translate the risk to action to recommendation. So if we don't, we are not doing the basic, the risk classification, how we can manage properly the, 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 the foot risk. Um, so it's why it's important to, to conduct the foot risk evaluation and to, to screen for loss of protective sensation. And uh, we have to do prevention, health promotion, awareness, and this is, and we have to do to this for everything, uh, education, self-management. So we have to empower the person to, uh, to, to have, uh, we want our patient to have an active role in their health. And there is a, an important part of the management and the, all about the glycemic control uh, from the, the primary care for the people at risk. So this is important to not think that we will manage everything once the person have a problem. We need to manage it in prevention in the primary care. And it is demonstrated that glycemic control is more efficacious on type one diabetes than in type two diabetes, but there is contradictory evidence, but it demonstrates that it can lower the incidence of DPN in type one diabetes. Uh, it's it's uh, the risk of to develop uh, DPN. It's equal if we if we manage the glycemic control or not. Uh, it, 
it, when, the management of glycemic control is not about painful neuropathy. Uh, the cardiovascular risk factor, so lifestyle and weight management can prevent the onset of DPN and prove the mother, mother conduction. Uh, dyslipidemia, so the use of statin is associated with a, a decreased incidence of DPN. It can improve the neurophysiological measure and hypertension management. Um, particularly, there is benefit of angiotensin convention enzyme inhibitor inhibitor for DPM. And there is different disease modifying treatments like antioxidants, alpha lipoic acid, et cetera, but there is no strong evidence yet. In the management, uh, there, there is a lot of things to do and it, this is complicated to all to explain it, but I wanted to focus on the, the treatment of the painful uh, DPM. So the first line, the first, the first thing that we need to do is to address psychological morbidity and functionality. But there is first line and other line treatment. So the first line agent is the dulolexin and tricyclic agent, um, like uh, amitriptyline, imipramine. So this is serotonin neuroepinephrine neuroptic reoptic inhibition. Um, it may be initiated in primary care. And after that, to depends, it depends on if it is efficacy, the efficacy or not. If, it, it is, if there is efficacy, we, uh, we can continue this way. But if it is only partial efficacy, uh, we need to do a combination treatment. And if there is more, too, more, too much and there's a uh, adverse event, we have to find an adverse an alternative first agent. And then we have to, 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 try, to try with the, the, the patient what, what it, it fits the condition of the patient. And then when it's not working, we have to go to a specialist pain team referral. Uh, and there is, another, there is other things that we can do for, for that. I will have lack of time, sorry. So there is many algori algorithms to treat painful diabetes neuropathy and, and it depends of the person. And this is another algorithm, but it is the similar one, but it's, it's explained in other, uh, an, another way. There is also emergent treatment, but in the phase of clinical trials and preclinical studies, uh, but none are not, are. It, are, are very efficient right now. And um, there is also the pain phenotyping and treatment response, like analgesic response, depending on pain phenotype. But right now, there is a lot of research, but nothing very promising. The combination of therapy, the efficacy of combination therapy is the more promising treatment right now. And to identify the professional strategy to manage DPN, it is the interprofessional team organization. Uh, if we focus, the literature right now focuses a lot in the limb preservation team and screening clinic for diabetes of foot amputation, uh, including as a core, a coordinator of the team, the podiatrist, the vascular surgeon, and endocrinologist and nurse. But for DPN, uh, the, the focus the, the coordinator should be other per, another person, should be the endocrinologist, the urologist, and pain specialist, and include other person and the patient and their family caregiver. Uh, but we have also to be a functional team. To be a functional team, we have to have basic skill for professional collaboration. So we know we have to know what are the role qualification of the person within the team and how we will manage our own team to manage DPN. We have to have a good interprofessional communication and to focus on the individual, individual center of care. What are the goals of the patient? Uh, how can we engage the patient? We have to uh, have strategies to uh, to the conflict within the team, and we have to have a collaboration leadership. We have to manage the DPN uh, uh, 
we have to do a holistic management of DPN. So the focus should be on the symptoms. So neuropathic pain, comorbid mood disorder, insomnia, autonomic symptoms and unsteadiness and fall. And the communication is the key within the team. So there is different profession with different backgrounds. So we are not speaking the same language. There is a, a communication within the team, but also with the patient. And we have to include social cultural barriers uh, when we, we communicate with patients. We have to be current and consistent. It's so complicated to manage the diabetic foot, uh, neuro, uh, the DPN. So if we're not current and consistent within the team and be, between healthcare provider, the patient will be lost and it will be complicated to manage uh, already complication condition. I put this to demonstrate that the medical models and the patient model is really different. So as a team, if we, uh, we explain all the pathway to develop diabetic foot complication uh, related to neuropathy, uh, the patient will not be able to understand because the patient, what they understand is that they understand that all their problem and the neuropathy, it's because of the poor blood circulation. So we have to find a path to find a way to explain to the patient what is the condition and why the, this patient has this condition. So we have to speak their languages and it's why I put this, this uh, model. DPN is a complex and multifactorial condition. Pa patient, uh, we have to enhance patients and their care. So that can tra tragic quality care. So we have to focus on Bud and Meyer quadruple Haynes. Uh, we have to do a personalized medicine and a way to do it is to share goal between patient and care provider. And this is so important in DPN to include shared decision making that take in account the value and preferences of the patient that can increase satisfaction of both uh, the patients, caregivers, and also of the, of the healthcare team. It can, can provide a sustainable healthcare practice and it can enhance the quality of care. So I put here the, the interprofessional shared decision-making models. That it, this explained that in the DPM, uh, the DPN, uh, there is a decision to be made. So how to manage the DPN uh, symptoms. And you, we have to provide, uh, we have to do an information exchange. We have to provide um, uh, accuracy, uh, Accuracy, uh, we have to provide good data from the literature about different uh, treatment to treat the painful neuropathy. And we have to, to know what are the value and the preferences of the patient. We have to, to know what the patient wants and if it is feasible about he, what he wants, because it can have some health condition that it can take one molecules, one pharma, 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 pharma um, drugs, one, one drug's molecule is not able to have it because they have a kidney disease. And the patient will share to the team the preferred choices. And this need to be shared between the family uh, and also between the decision coach and with all the team. And in the, the DPN, the decision coach should be the pain specialist, the neurologist and endocrinologist. Uh, so if the pain management, you don't have those kind of people, uh, it may have a problem. There is uh, recent uh, data uh, from a uh, family, Canadian family physician that th demonstrate what are the benefits of the treatment of, of option for the pain uh, neuropathic, but they don't uh, put the rehabilitation program. And it, it, those are all the molecules I already uh, a little bit uh, shared with you earlier. But if you need to, to know more detail about dosage, you can go to the Diabetes, Canadian, uh, uh, Diabetes Canada guidelines. And what I wanted to tell you is that, yes, there is pharmacological treatment, but there is also um, non pharmacological non-pharmacological treatment. And as an example, there is rehabilitation program, but there is also exercise for neuropathic pain. It has been demonstrated that general exercise focus, focusing on distal extremities or on the combination of aerobic and moderate intensity or intensity exercise can help to support, to alleviate the symptoms of painful neuropathic syndrome. And for that, we need to have a kinesiologist or a physical therapist within the team to support the exercise. Uh, 
Um, it is an effective alternative treatment or complementary therapy, and it can also reduce the risk of falls. And uh, there is many intervention about that, like stretching exercise, balance, balance practice, aerobic exercise, working program, and tai chi. So this this is not all about this is not about molecules and drugs. There is other other things that we can do to to manage painful neuropathy. And it is, it is why I came back to the interprofessional shared decision making. If we don't present all the options to the patient, the patient will don't know all what he can have in his toolbox to, to support the, the painful neuropathy. So it is our mission as a team and as clinic clinician to present all the 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 the, the the information and, and to support the patient to make the decision about how he should, how he should manage his own health. So it is all about empower, empowerment of the patient and it can help, uh, it can help to manage this part of the neuropathy, the painful neuropathy. So finally, in conclusion, shared decision-making for painful neuropathy is maybe a solution to uh, to manage right now the painful neuropathy as we don't know what is the correct combination of treatment but this is pretty new uh, the guideline uh, the guideline from canadian family physician from coronic in 2022 so uh, only two months ago uh, suggests to go in this path because we know from previous study that shared decision making can higher the satisfaction uh, higher their adherence to the options selected by the patient. So if the patient select a choice, it may, may be more helpful for the patient than if it is a choice that is pushed by the, the team itself. It enhances quality of life. So we know that uh, there, is, there is a problem of quality of life with painful neuropathy and it can support uh, good health behavior. So it's what we need to do to... Uh, to have less complication. But shared decision-making, it's really promising, but it's also a challenge to interprofessional approach because it's, it's, it, it's, it's a complicated framework and you, you have to be trained in shared decision-making. So right now there is more evidence needed to support clinical intervention uh, to share decision-making to neuropathy and painful neuropathy, but it's really promising. So thank you for listening. I hope you understand me. Uh, thank you to, to Diabetes Canada for the invitation and I'm here for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Regine. That was, that was really great. Um, we do have uh, some questions rolling in. What I'll do while we give folks the opportunity to type in the Q&A box and ask your, your questions, uh, we would uh, love to hear them. We would love to try to answer them. Um, I'll just quickly say, if you enjoyed today's presentation, you might want to consider becoming a professional member of Diabetes Canada. And actually, our first question in the chat is from Tom, who is the chair of our a foot care a special interest group, one of our primary care groups, which you could be a part of if you are a member of Diabetes Canada. So diabetes.ca slash membership will get you to our professional membership. It's great. You get a discount to our conference. You get access to Canadian Journal of Diabetes and the Diabetes Communicator and all sorts of other great benefits. Uh, as well, today's presentation is free for healthcare providers. So if you uh, enjoyed today's presentation, found value in it, um, we could use support from folks like you, uh, diabetes.ca slash donate if you can. So the first question here is from Tom. Can CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, be helpful in living with painful DPM? Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I would say, I would say yes. Okay. I, I saw some evidence, I saw some evidence about it, uh, because uh, there is some evidence that um, uh, motivational interviewing and uh, comportmental uh, can help uh, to the symptoms. So the answer is yes. Okay, great. Um, we'll let the other questions float in here as we have a bit more time before today's presentation uh, is complete. Um, please ask, ask away. Although perhaps the lack of questions is because your presentation was so thorough, Virginia. 
I don't know. I have uh, some difficulties <laughs> with my language. I, I, I know that yeah. the end was a little bit uh, faster than the beginning, but um, it's hard. Uh, it's hard to because there is plenty of different people with different backgrounds. So we cannot jump into to, um, to, to complicating things at the beginning. So we have to review the first yes. thing. So yeah. Um, no, that was great. I'm going to, we'll just let the question uh, box be open for a little bit longer. If maybe you have any, any final words there before uh, we'll see if we get any more questions. All right, I think we'll we'll leave it there if you have questions. What I will say is one thing um, we're going to do is we have our lovely online community. So if you are a professional member, that's community.diabetes.ca. You get access to a community forum where you can ask questions. We will create a discussion group about uh, today's webinar as well as Dr. Jeremy Gilbert, uh, Gilbert presented on um, insulin options with so many how to, how to choose. Uh, great presentation. We're going to make that available um, on demand. And if you want to continue discussing, uh, keep in the loop about uh, today's presentation from Virginia and as well as Dr. Gilbert's, um, you can join us in our online community. It's community.diabetes.ca. It is members only, um, but uh, yeah, can we keep chatting about these uh, very important um, topics? I'll give the last word to Virginia before we, we head out for the afternoon oh so thank you everybody and um yeah so what i want to say to everybody um i want <laughs> just um the, the 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 screening can be done by everybody nurses podiatrists mm -hmm. physician family physician nurse practitioner nutritionist physiotherapist so don't be afraid to perform uh a foot screening. Um, uh, I want to say that there is enough place to everybody, and if we are able to to identify foot screen uh, foot risk to the patient, it will support how we will manage all the possible complication thereafter, and it's all as clinical professional we can act again amputations. All right. Amazing. With that, we will sign out for the afternoon. Thank you so much for everyone who attended. Thank you, Virginia, for presenting. This was great. And everyone should have a great day. Thank you.